Hello and welcome to the What's For Dinner show. My name's Lynn and my aim, along with my guests, is to explore how our food experiences have influenced our lives as well as our waistlines. I'm also joined on the show by Michael O'Halloran for our regular feature, The Nugget of Knowledge, where we focus on a particular food topic. It could be a deep dive into a particular item of food, a trawl through the latest food news or a discussion about a food trend. God forbid we'd have cockles and I'd put as much vinegar on them as possible to try and sort of get some sort of taste into them. It was just like chewing gum really, tasteless chewing gum to me. And don't like to be one of these people that go abroad and won't sample things. So I have crashed and burned a few times, but also had some success as well. Born in Wales, but raised mainly in Bridgewater, Somerset, my guest this week is Mo Hopkins, a man for whom football has always been a central part of life. After spending his youth on the pitch, Mo is currently a key part of the football development team at Bridgewater and Taunton College, and also head of football for Somerset County Schools. As a result of his work, he's on the training pitch most days and most evenings, and believes a healthy diet is good for both body and mind. I, I don't, I can't put my finger on it, but if I've not eaten fruit or had vegetables for a day, I can, I can tell I just don't feel the same. I don't feel as bright and chirpy. Welcome to the What's for Dinner show, Mo. Tell me a little bit about your life as a footballer. I played uh, for my hometown, Bridgewater Town, which is a semi-professional team. So I got injured when I was 21, I think it was. So it took me a long time to uh, probably get over it because I, I was so young. Um, I didn't get a chance to, if you like, um, have my pomp as a footballer and, and do the best I could. So it sort of cut me short. So, yeah, I had regrets when I was young, but obviously you always have regrets. But, um, yeah, it's not a problem. I'm happy where I am now. And how did you first get into football? Oh, like a lot of people, my, my dad was into football coaching, so he he ran our junior football club back in the day. So did your dad used to take you to, to watch games on the weekend? Yeah, not we didn't, we didn't go and watch many um, big games, if you like, or professional games, but I remember going to watch Swansea City, because that was my uh, where I was born, where I'm from, Swansea. So I've been to watch Swansea when they were in the old first division, a couple of other clubs as well, but generally just local football, like your Bridgewater Towns and your Taunton Towns. Oh, okay. So you're a Welsh boy then? I am Welsh, yes. God's country. <laughs> and so what were the um, half-time snacks like at Swansea City back in the day? I think they were all pretty much the same. It was like bovril. Bovril? Yeah, bovril <laughs> and those sort of things and pies and um, all pretty sort of bland and stodgy sort of food, really. Yeah, I guess that's what you need on a cold winter's day, though. Yeah, definitely. And when you used to get home from the match, would your mum have... Hot dinner on the table for you? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes she would, or she'd say, you know, go and help yourself, and you'd sort yourself out. And uh, yeah, she'd sometimes make something for us, or we'd have to go and look after ourselves. So, how would you describe growing up in Wales? Um, to be fair, we we moved away because my dad used to work for top rank industry, so we dotted around the country, and we ended up in Bridgewater at quite a young age. So, I'd, although I used to go back every holidays to to Wales, my, my earliest memories are really Somerset and Wales as a holiday destination. And so what kind of culinary delights would you have had on holiday in Wales? Would oh. you stay with family or in a Yeah, we'd B&B? stay with family. So you'd have um, we'd always stay with family. We'd have you know, I'd, God forbid we'd have cockles and I'd put as much vinegar on them as possible <laughs> to try and sort of get some sort of taste into them. It was just like chewing gum really, tasteless chewing gum to me and we'd always go to a fish and chip shop on the mumbles. Nowadays, when you're at home, do you do much cooking? No, I don't do a lot of cooking. My wife does, um, because obviously, as you know, I'm out doing football. um, So generally, Kath will prepare a meal. Um, So no, I I, I do every so often do a pasta. I like doing me pasta bakes. So I'll do that with chicken and vegetables and uh, cheese. I do like me cheese, unfortunately. So I'm a bit (laughs) guilty of that. Yeah, and that's good. Yeah, so she kind of has your favourite dishes on rotation yes yeah definitely on rotation so she'll sort of do it week by week and so how do you think sort of what you used to eat as a child is kind of different to what you might be eating nowadays 
I remember as a child, we would always definitely always have a roast on a Sunday. Um, and that would either be a chicken or it would mainly be a chicken or a pork, um, sometimes beef, but mainly chicken or pork. So we'd have that on a regular basis. But during the week, my mum used to make a lovely curry. She used to do a nice curry. Her stew was amazing. But in between that, it would pretty much be pizzas, chips, sort of like the quick stuff, really. Fish um, fingers. Yeah, fish. God, fish fingers. Yeah, <laughs> fish fingers, fish fingers sandwiches. Um, all the sort of things that were on TV and the commercials, really. It's sort of like people got drawn towards them and they would be the things that you eat. I think everything would have been handed down over the years from grandparents to mums and then comes down to us and they would have, like you said, recycled all that as well. And, and now there's so much more access to different um, ingredients, material through the internet. So it has opened our, you know, broadened our horizons a lot. But still, it's still the old favourites though, curry and pizza and chips. <laughs> definitely, yeah, definitely. And what about trips abroad? Are you a big one for holidaying? We were for a period of time. We used to do the, the Spain, the France, the Grand Canaria, but we haven't done it for a long time. The two jobs I've got at the moment, they sort of cross over. So when my term finishes at college, I'm still working at the school. And then when school finishes, I've started back up with the college. So my summer is... Yeah, is over and yeah, done with quite yeah, quickly. Yeah, it's only really a couple of weeks, really. Yeah, yeah that's but we, true. But we did do Spain quite a few times and um, some of the, the local dishes. Um, and I don't like to be one of these people that go abroad and won't sample things. So I have crashed and burned a few times, but All also right. had some success as well. <laughs> so come on then, what have you crashed and burned with? Uh, fish fish dishes. I'm not. <laughs> I'm a bit bland when it comes to fish dishes. Um, so um, I've had a few... Uh, fish dishes that didn't go down too well and <laughs> that can ruin your holiday oh definitely yeah, right show, don't. <laughs> we won't go there anymore. no <laughs> so i guess something like that would be a disastrous meal that you've had are there any kind of other meals you can think of where it's just gone horribly wrong oh god yes my stepfather made a curry and it was it was like pot puree it was all fragrance didn't taste like anything i was used to on my palate it was definitely an acquired taste. <laughs> God, you know, I do like chicken dishes. Being into sports and um, and stuff, I do. I don't like the heavy the heavy meat. During the sort of summer period, it it probably be salads more than anything, or yeah. it might be you know a, a chicken curry, but a light one, or chicken just chicken with. A, uh, recently, I've just been having chicken with reggae reggae sauce. Ooh. Bit of um, uh, fried rice, and that, that's me done, really. Yeah. I've got to be honest, it gives you some really good energy to push on. And obviously, I'd, like you said, I do like fruit, or I do like a bit of salad, or vegetables go with it, because you've got to have that as well. The sort of youngsters that, that you're working with at the college, do they have a good understanding of what they should be eating to maximise their fitness and their health? I think so. Uh, I think sometimes everyone's guilty of being a bit lazy, but I think they're they're well educated by the college in terms of what's going to be good for them to eat, digest, and obviously give them as much, if you like, bang for the buck, in, because you want you want something that's going to sustain your energy levels for you to work hard on the pitch, off the pitch, and get yourself ready. So um, they seem to be okay. Although when we have away games, they all want to stop in Kentucky or <laughs> they want to get a Big Mac. Um, so, yeah, they, they sort of slip on match day, but after the game. Yeah, well, I guess that's it's just like a celebratory tradition, isn't it? Yes. To, to stop at a fast food outlet yeah. on the motorway and get what you know you shouldn't be having. They're certainly a lot more educated than what I was when I was young. Mm. We, even down to the fluids that you take now and the minerals and replacing all that, and we we just drank water because we thought we were hot whereas we didn't realize it was a necessity to make sure that you keep your fluid levels high for sort of decision making and obviously keeping you from getting into that level of fatigue what about the sort of protein drinks and all the sort of supplement things that youngsters can you know get their hands on nowadays yeah there's certainly evidence to suggest that doing that um, within a window after a game is is important because uh, protein obviously helps with repair the the muscles and uh, the fibers and so that there, there certainly was a cluster of the boys that did it religiously and you could tell it made an impact because you just looked at their body frame and you could tell they looked very athletic yeah so it can contribute but i guess it just needs to be kept in perspective and part of a healthy diet yeah yeah definitely p- part of a healthy diet i mean like you say you, you can have cheat days every now and then as a bit of a treat but i think it's important 
especially if you're thinking about the finer margins and the top end of sport, that you do need to look at every little avenue to give yourself an edge. Even literally 10 years ago, you could probably be a very talented footballer and on talent alone, you could play at a reasonable level. I think now to play at a really good, reasonable level, you need to be an athlete as well as talented. Um, So I think it's changed a little bit now because everybody's switched on to looking after their bodies a little bit better. Um, They're a little bit more dedicated. It certainly helps to make sure you stay on top of it. I think anything that's going to reduce your ability to perform you you've, you find it rarer and rarer nowadays. You certainly can't um, go out and have eight points um, and then get up the next day and expect to perform or even train at the best level that you should be. And it, it's going to affect you eventually. Yeah, yeah. So if you're out in Bridgewater and you spotted one of your lads having a couple of beers the night before a match, would they be on the starting bench? Probably, probably not, no. Because if you let them get away with it once, they'll do it again. If you let them get away with it, Somebody else might want to get away with it and then all of a sudden you've got chaos in your team and you've got no no order, no um, dedication. So yeah, you'd certainly have a little bit of a word in their shell. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> on a day-to-day basis then, you obviously place, you know, quite a lot of importance on, on what you eat. Um, you know, do you, are you an advocate of, of any particular sort of diet or one of these fasting diets that people are quite keen on now? Have you ever tried anything like that? I'm quite fortunate because I'm so active. I can I don't need to be religious on how much I eat. I can pretty much eat reasonably well without worrying about it. But I do try and eat healthy if I can. So uh, plus I do a lot of cycling. And if I'm carrying excess weight, then it's harder for me to get up the hills. Do you find that if you have a day where you're not eating well, that it does make you feel not as good sort of mentally as well as physically oh definitely mentally I, I don't I can't put my finger on it but if I've not eaten fruit or had vegetables for a day I can I can tell I just don't feel the same I don't feel as bright and chirpy I feel a little bit lethargic so I try to make sure that I keep on top of having my fruit having my vegetables you know wh- whether that's in a, a form of eating it raw as it is or you have it in a meal Um, So, yeah, that's definitely part of my regular diet. So are you a a smoothie lover? Do you get the old Nutra bullet blender out? I was for a while, actually. I I was was having my smoothies regularly for a while. Now, I've got switched off a little bit. Right, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So I've gone back to me raw fruit now. Um, but I, yes, I have I have been an advocate of having the smoothies. Um, when I was young, my dad used to try and get me to eat raw tomatoes. Um, I can mm. have tomatoes blended, put on a pizza, but I, I can't eat a raw tomato. Um, right. It, 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 <laughs> that feeling, that, that urge feeling, because when I was young, it used to make me, because of the, the sharpness of it, um, that's one of the foods that I tried to avoid. And the more and more he used to try and make me do it, the more it would switch him off. And people laugh at this. I, I chop up bananas on top of my cornflakes or frosties. And then I, I crunch up um, nuts, mixed nuts, and put that on top. Well, so that was always a go-to yeah. for me. <laughs> my friend and I, we used to have uh, Weetabix and we would have them dry and smear them with butter yes, and done banana that. if we could. Done yeah. that, yeah. So they're like a, a biscuit. A no, bit. exactly. There's no milk, so you just have, yeah. you add the Weetabix dry. I've got some in the cupboard. Maybe I'll give it a try. <laughs> Bolognese was one mm. that I struggled with because you had the, was it plum tomatoes chopped up yeah, in there? Yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, yeah. Plum tomatoes, I struggled with spaghetti bolognese. And there is a funny story. We had a monster plant um, next to the, the dining table <laughs> and I would mix my spaghetti bolognese in with the soil Ooh. at the bottom of the monster plant to try and disperse it so I could get away with not eating it. That that was one. No uh, wonder the plant was a monster. It, and it, it was a big plant. It was a big plant. <laughs> Who's most inspired you, do you think, in terms of your eating habits? Watching the boys and what they eat and seeing how well they perform and then you find out what they're eating, that sometimes uh, makes a difference because you can always learn from everybody. They're They're good boys, they're switched on. Um, and you can learn a lot from them. Do they have their weight and height and heart rate and whatever monitored regularly as part of their, their yeah, training? Yeah, we, we track we track all those things and um, we track them every game and training as well to see what they're doing. 
um, to see if they're working at uh, the levels they should be working at or it could potentially show up some problems. Um, certainly if if what they've got access to and we'd have that access to mm. that as youngsters um, when we were young, it would uh, it would have made a big difference. Yeah, maybe we would have won the World Cup. I think so. De- <laughs> we've definitely done it by now, that's for sure. That's for sure. Well, maybe the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks, Mo. It's been lovely speaking to you. I hope everything goes well for you the rest of this season and into the next. Thank you very much, Lynn. Okay. Cheers. Hey, the show's not over just yet. Now it's time for a little nugget of knowledge. So my guest Mo Hopkins talked about eating fish and chips on the Mumbles in Wales, you know, when he used to go on holiday to Wales. Michael, do you remember if you ate fish and chips when you went on holiday? Yeah, sure. All the time. It was one of the seaside treats that we would have, really. I remember sitting, you know, on the promenade or on the beach and tucking into some fish and chips with my parents. Absolutely. So I bet while you were sat there, really think very much about the, the history of fish and chips. But no, I, I wasn't that deep, really. No, no, I don't suppose many people are about their, their Friday fish and chips. But I'm here to tell you that basically fish and chips were sold separately or as two different items. What a crazy idea that is. I know, imagine having them not together. So the fish coated in a light batter and fried in oil originated really with the Portuguese and Spanish Jewish communities. You know, so, so they used to serve fish on a Friday evening at the start of Shabbat or the, okay, the Sabbath. Yes, right. Because obviously in the Jewish religion they're not allowed to cook any food for 24 hours I think it is okay. yeah so they would have fish coated in in a flat light flour batter on a Friday evening and it was always fried in oil so that it could be eaten cold for the third Sabbath meal on the Saturday afternoon it's believed that that's where the idea of frying fish in batter originated from it was only in 1860 that they believed the first fish and chip shop was opened in London. So the first the time... the first fish and chips. Yeah, the first time yeah. that fish and chips were sold together as a sort of a, a takeaway meal in Bow in East London. And it was opened by an Eastern European Jewish immigrant called Joseph Malin. So there's the connection to right. the Jewish religion. Good old Charles Dickens, he mentions fried fish warehouses in Oliver Twist. Now that was in 1838 that was published and in 1845 a chap called Alexis Sawyer um, who wrote one of the sort of early cookbooks called A Shilling Cookery for the People he gives a recipe for fried fish Jewish fashion and it's a, a fish dipped in a batter mix of flour and water now the chips obviously they first appeared about the same time and again Charles Dickens mentions them in A Tale of Two Cities there's a, a quote from it from that novel. Husky chips of potato fried with some reluctant drops of oil. Why was, why was the oil reluctant? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to read uh, A Tale of Two Cities to well, get I, the full... <laughs> I've known some fish and chip shops where the oil was anything but reluctant. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so Charles Dickens was obviously a big, a big fan of fish... And chips separately, presumably. I'm not sure when he died, but if he was around in 1860, I'm sure he would have visited Joseph Malin's yeah. shop. Um, up north, by the way, uh, the first fish and chip shop apparently was opened by a chap called Mr John Lees. Um, and that was in about 1863. And so that was a, a tale of two chip shops. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, by 1910, there were over 25,000 fish and chip shops across the UK. And in the 1930s, there were over 35,000. 35,000? Yeah, that's, that's incredible, that, isn't it? It is a lot, but I suppose there wasn't much else. I don't know. Maybe pie yeah. and mash shops would have been around. Yeah, yeah. Jelly deals. Yeah, but in... we certainly wouldn't have had the variety that you see down Camden Market these days. No, that's right. You wouldn't have been able to get Vietnamese and, you know, Venezuelan yeah, food yeah. and goodness knows what else. Another weird thing I thought really was that the British government safeguarded the supply of fish and chips during the First World War and in the Second World War. So they safeguarded how did that? How did yeah, that well, in the Second World War it wasn't rationed. Oh right. Okay. Yeah, I think the idea was that fish and chips was such a kind of a popular treat 
for the working okay. class. Keeping morale up, maybe? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it was considered important. And, and according to legend, British soldiers storming the Normandy beaches on D-Day would identify each other by yelling out, FISH! And waiting for the coded response... Chips. Exactly. Hey, maybe we should try that, you know, next, <laughs> next time we're in a crowded space. Yeah, know. yeah, next time we go to a gig or a concert, yeah. I'll call you out. You can be fish and I'll be I'll chips. Be, yeah, 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 okay, we'll try it. Uh, so that's kind of all I know about the history of fish and chips, really. Well, it's I mean, a pretty grand history, really, isn't it? And a, there yeah. is, and, and another literary reference which I quite liked was um, in George Orwell's The Road to Wigan Pier, which was published in 1937, and that is about... I don't know if you've read that one, have you? Um, I'm not sure I have, actually. Sure. No, but it documents his experience of working-class life in the north of England. And again, he considered fish and chips among one of the home comforts, right. which acted as a panacea to the working classes. Oh, yeah, OK. Mm, okay. So, and he knew his stuff, George. So close down those fish and chip shops at your peril. Um, and, of course... Very famous fish and chip entrepreneur, Harry Ramsden. He opened his first fish and chip shop in 1928. His, one of his shops was in the Guinness Book of Records because in 1952, this particular shop served 10,000 portions of fish and chips in a day. Is that just a, you know, a particularly busy day or had he set out to do that? Do well, think? I'm thinking he probably... If he was he in probably, the Guinness Book of Records, he probably set he out He probably to set out to do it. He probably advertised and encouraged people to come. Yeah, but yeah. still, to be able to serve that many, he must have had some pretty speedy fryers and... Chip. Yeah, yeah, back in 1952. Yeah, yeah, chip yeah. choppers. And it's quite hard work because I, I did actually work in a chip shop. I know, me too. I've worked in mm. a fish and chip shop. We, we don't really think about the, the effort that goes into producing the fish and chips in the chip shop and the, the hard work that goes into it because it looks like such, in some respects, a very simple food, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, great care needs to be taken in actually producing really good fish and chips. Yeah, absolutely. Nowadays, of course, there's only about 10,500 fish and chip shops in the UK, according to the National Federation of Fish Friars. Still a pretty big number, though. They serve 380 million meals of fish and chips every year. Wow, so how, what does that kind of work out? In terms <laughs> it works of, out. <laughs> I have the, How many fish and chip portions should here. I be eating? It's the equivalent of six servings of fish and chips to every man, woman and child in the UK. Six? Mm. Okay. I reckon, you know, since we, we moved... And had um, one of potentially the best, uh, well, if not the best uh, fish and chip shop quite local to us, uh, the Blue Ocean here in Taunton. I'm going to really overachieve on that front. <laughs> yeah. How many have you had since we moved here in February? I've probably had at least five. Right. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to go way over. So 80% of the UK population buy fish and chips once a year and 22% buy it every week. 22% every week. Mm. Well, well, like you say, it's a Friday night tradition for a lot of people. Right, now, come on. Nutrition-wise, what do you think? Fish and chips, good or bad? I would say pretty good, especially if you have the mushy peas. Okay. You know, I suppose the, the balance of protein and carbohydrate and fats, it's probably not that bad. It all depends on how well it's cooked, which I imagine is to do with the quality of the oil, the yeah. temperature of the oil... How often the oil is changed, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and, all, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so if you go to a decent place, then presumably the nutritional value is going to be better. I mean, uh, looking at the um, NFFF, which is the so National Federation so <laughs> National Federation of Fish Fries, so they have uh, looked at two hundred and fifty grams of chips cut into one point four centimeters by one point seven centimeter chip slices that apparently is the optimum it's a pretty robust piece of science it there. is and uh that ha has just under 600 calories so you know that's yeah that's pretty hefty isn't it's it? pretty hefty but and then a, a 150 gram cod portion has got around 320 calories assuming, i don't think 320 is not is not bad for us no i mean i'm assuming yeah. that's the fish and the batter i mean that's yeah, got to yeah. be the end product hasn't yeah, it that yeah. you're consuming yeah. yeah so again the quality of the batter probably comes yeah it's everything isn't it? yeah. and it does vary a lot due to the portion sizes some of the fish that we've had from the fish shop down the road have been huge you know chip portions are always huge 
Yeah, so next time we have it, we might get the scales out and have a weigh. It's coming in then at about 900 calories, sort of as an average, which to my mind is probably the same as about a burger. Yeah, yeah. Maybe even less if you had a burger with lots of other toppings and cheese and goodness knows what else on. But they reckon that you'd have to run for an hour and 15 minutes to burn off the equivalent calories. You could have fish and chips on the Friday and then up and out for a run. A long run on the Saturday. On the Saturday morning. (laughs) Okay. Oh dear. And if you're looking for quality fish and chips, the good old NFFF publishes an annual list of accredited fish and chip Ah, shops that meet their, their high standards. been in the news quite a lot lately fish and chips yeah because of the price rises isn't it, absolutely really? yeah i mean the price rises of fish and chips due to mainly the impact of the war in in ukraine really that's the main impact yeah it? it would seem so uh just in the last week or so there's been talk about the challenges for supplying wheat uh to the the, the global food market and obviously that's required for fish batter ukraine is known as the bread basket of europe yeah. for the amount of wheat that it provides and that's not been happening in addition to that rising energy costs yeah and um, plus the cost of gas has um meant that fertilizer has also gone up in price which has affected the price of potatoes yeah. so it's like a perfect storm well it is really, really so. yeah i mean we produce a lot of our own fertilizer and apparently quite a lot comes from russia so on both counts, supplies right. have been disrupted. It's, it's quite worrying, really. Like, you know, you say that the number of fish and chip shops has, you know, it's easy for me to say, isn't it? Fish and chip shops has uh, has decreased, you know, it's down to 10,000 now. Is that what you said, mm, I 10 think? 10,500, yeah. Hopefully this latest kind of, you know, battering that they're taking um, is, is not going to affect the numbers even more, you know? Well, I mean, it probably will. You know, I mean, the supply of fish, around 40% of the fish sold mm. come from Russian trawlers. So obviously right, okay. that's yeah. a bit of a challenge. And then the uh, UK and American governments have issued trade sanctions against Russia, which have also increased the prices of fish. Right. So tariffs yeah. on fish imports from Russia are now stand at 35%, which uh, I think yeah. is considerably yeah. more than they used to be. Um, sunflower oil as well which is often used for the frying yeah russia and ukraine produce over 50 percent of the world's sunflower seeds which are used to manufacture sunflower oil so that has been problematic and then last but not least there's been a return to 20 percent vat on the catering industry of course, which yeah. i think was waived or or reduced anyway due da- during the covid That's right. pandemic yeah. last time you bought fish and chips how much did it cost you? A portion of chips and a couple of cod, and that was about £16. Right, okay. You know. So do you think it represented value for money? I think so, yeah, mm, absolutely. Mm. Funny enough, actually, there was, well, there was there was a fight there when I was there, yeah. One of the fish got battered. Sorry, <laughs> I had to say that. Yeah, tough times generally. You've kind of helped me understand a little bit more about the fish and chip industry and actually the impacts that it's suffering at the moment. Mm, Yeah, definitely. So it kind of means that, you know, Friday Fish and Chips is uh, taking a battering, but it's battering the pocket as well. It's still value for money compared to, you know, pizzas and curry, maybe not to a McDonald's-type meal. Yeah, maybe, but it's a different... A Big Mac meal for sort of under six quid but it's know. a different you know it's a different experience isn't yeah it? yeah it yeah. is yeah yeah i know which one i'd prefer personally yeah fish and chips absolutely <laughs> so have you got any more fish and chip jokes that you want to share with us michael uh i've got one other i think Go on, then. um guy walks into a chip shop with a fish under his arm says to the guy behind the counter have you got any fish cakes the guy says no sorry we don't do fish cakes he says that's a shame it's his birthday today And on that, we'll sign off. (laughs) Bye. Until next time. (laughs) Thanks for listening to episode four of the What's for Dinner show. If you enjoyed it, please share to anyone you know and help me spread the word about my new podcast. You can usually share from your podcast provider. It might be Apple or it might be Spotify. Or you can find me on Facebook where you can follow my page and share my posts. Search for at What's for Dinner show. Why not check out my previous episodes? You can listen to Carrie Crane talk about her journey to health and fitness 
And if you're looking for a way to get exercise into your own life, you can sign up to her fitness classes, mention the What's For Dinner show and get your first week's membership free. Once again, thanks for listening. See you next time. Just before I go, I'd like to say thank you to...